So let's get started. So first I want to talk about what Python is. Python is an extremely powerful language. It's used in many ways. Um, I use it to create websites. Um, but I know people that use it to create games, to do server-side stuff, um, to work with data. It's a very easy to learn, but extremely powerful language. Um, it's also very easy to extend. They have, it comes with a really big library of stuff, so you can add it in and with like two lines of code, do a whole bunch of new stuff. And there's also lots of people that develop, de 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 there's also lots of people that develop for it. So if you go on GitHub, there's like a module for pretty much anything you would ever want to do. Um, now, Python, there's two Pythons right now. There's Python 2 and Python 3 that are currently being supported. Um, for a beginner, there isn't a huge difference. And while a few years ago I cautioned beginners away from Python 3, that was not because it was harder. That was just because um, a lot of the modules hadn't moved over, many of the libraries, like all the cool stuff you would want to use and do just wasn't compatible yet, or they were partially compatible. Like they'd say, oh, we're Python 3 compatible, as long as you didn't want to use this thing over here, which I don't call compatible. But now everything's pretty much moved over that you would want to use. So now I feel comfortable bringing you know, new developers into the fold. While there are a lot of changes, they tend to be deep in the internals or for more advanced users. For beginners, like the biggest thing that might trip you up is the print statement. Like That's it. Um, and if you do see me screwing up the print statement now and then, it's because my work uses Python 2. And we haven't fully, con we haven't converted over yet. So you will occasionally see me screw up. So the first thing we need to do is if you are using Cloud9, you probably want to um, actually make sure you're using Python 3. Because if you just use the way it's set up, it'll use Python 2. So I'm going to have you put in two magic commands. And I don't think you need to like see this, but this is the terminal window. So here you have your file browser, here you have where you're going to actually edit your code, and this is your terminal. Bring it up. And you'll want to type in the following two commands, which hopefully you can see. And they are in the notes, so you'll just want to copy and paste without the, without the tick marks. Oh, like I just did. So sudo move user bin python to user bin python2, um, sudo link ln dash s user bin python3 to user bin python. Um, what this is doing is it's basically taking python2 and it's swapping it out for python3. So if we type python, it should say 343. Three. And we'll go into need to get out of that, just hit control D. So let's start talking about just the basics of working with Python. And there's two ways that you're mostly going to be working with Python. You'll be working with it in something called the REPL, which is the read, evaluate, print loop, and the editor. Uh, the REPL is one of the places it's really actually kind of nice to learn in there and play around. I spend a large amount of my day in the REPL. It's not a place where you would save code. It's kind of a place where you mess around. One mistake I see a lot of beginners do is they try to write all their code in the REPL and then try to put it in a file. And at that point, no, it's like, don't do that because you have to like, everything gets messed up and you've got to fix it. Um, the REPL is literally just for messing around. Um, the REPL looks like this. So if you go into your terminal and you type Python, this is the REPL, the three asterisks. Now, one thing you might see, some people use IPython, which looks a little different. It'll say in one, that's IPython. But right now we're just gonna use the standard Python REPL because IPython doesn't come on every system. So, and you may not have the opportunity to like install it. So this is the REPL. Um, it literally takes a line of code, reads it, 
evaluates it, like runs it, and then waits for the next line of code. So it's one of those things where it just, you know, you waits and it does, and it waits and it does. It doesn't store any, like, it doesn't store a bunch of lines. Um, it's not where you'd want to do, like, serious coding. But for right now, let's do a line of code. So we're going to do print parentheses, hello world. And it prints out hello world. And the print statement is exactly what it says. It prints something out to your screen. Um, so print hello world, prints out hello world. Pretty obvious. So now, so that is how the REPL works. To get out of the REPL, do control D, and that gets you out of it. Now, if you want to work in a file, up here, go to File, New File. And you want to save it as whatever.py. So I'm going to save this one as uh, part1.py. So py, not pie, not pi, py, as in Python. Now here, I'm going to say, and I think I accidentally typed up here. No, OK. Print hello world. And in Cloud9, you can just hit the run. And if you look down here, a screen pops up. Doo -doo -doo. And it prints out hello world. Now, it does print out all this other stuff because Cloud9 makes some assumptions. It assumes that you're running code to share with the world and that you're running like a web server or something like that. And we're not doing that. We're just printing hello world. So this is really what happened. So that's the difference between working in a file and working in a REPL. So just to sum up, you work in a file if you want to have code that you want to save and run again, because we can run this again. It'll just keep running. You can run it multiple times. Uh, and you work in the REPL if you want to mess around, if you want to see how something works, if you have some data you're trying to explore, uh, that's when you'd work in a REPL. And the more experienced you get, the more you start to get a feel for when you want to do one versus the other. But it's very important to know how both of those things work. So the first thing we should do, come here, is we're going to save a value to a variable. And a variable is just a container, like a cup. Um, it has a name. You know, you can give it a name. So this one I'll call apples. I'm going to say apples equals 5. And so we basically have a container called apples, and we put the value 5 in it. And we can change that value. It's very important to save temporary bits of data. And that's the reason it's called a variable, is that that value is going to vary. It's going to change over time, um, presumably. So we have apples equals 5, print apples. And if we run this, prints out 5. We can also change the value in apples. Apples equals 7. prints out 5, and then prints out 7, because apples held 5. And then when we set it to 7, we dumped out the 5. It went off into the ether, and 7 was saved in apples. And this is pretty common, that you just dump out values, you put in new values. Um, some caveats about variable names. Now, for everyone that is coming from a different language, um, I had a Java person um, lose her mind in one of my classes because I showed this and she's like but you didn't you didn't initialize the variable in Python you do not have to initialize a variable uh, you don't have some other language you have to say okay I'm going to create a variable it's going to always hold integers or you know text or whatever and it's going to have you know this is the max value you don't really do that in Python. If you create a variable and you put something in it, Python just kind of makes the assumption that, oh, you probably want to create a variable and put this thing in it. Um, so if you're coming from another language, this is just how Python does it. Uh, we, don't, we do very little initialization. So let's do some math. Uh, math is very basic uh, in Python. So Actually, I'm going to go down and work, do this in the REPL. 
And if you want to make your REPL big, there's a little window thingy over here, a little icon. Unfortunately, I can make my text big, but the icons don't get any bigger. So you're looking for the little bunch of windows icon. And I'm going to clear. I'm going to do Python. And math is super simple. So 5 plus 5 is 10, so plus sign, 5 minus 2, well, probably want to make it look nicer than that. 5 minus 2 is 3, so you just use the minus sign. For multiplication, use the asterisks. And people are more used to this now. It used to throw people off, but I think people are just more used to not using like an X or whatever. Um, and for division, use the forward slash, which is at the bottom row of your keyboard. 5.0. Now, one of the nice things, if you worked in Python 2, um, if you divided a whole number by a whole number, you got back a whole number, which caused weir rounding weirdness. That no longer is the case. If you divide 1 by 2, you get 0 0.5. And old school Python people were like, oh, thank God, I hated explaining this like to every person. Um, so that's basically the two kinds of numbers you work with are integers and floats. And integers are whole numbers and floats are decimal numbers. And you can actually find out what kind of data type, um, what kind of number something is by using type. So if you type one, you get class int. If you do type 1.0, you get class float. And sometimes you wanna check for this. Um, about types. All data has a type. It is a type of thing. And there are many kinds of data types. When you start off, there's not that many. It's like a very limited number. But as you get into more advanced Python, um, you create new data types. And you create really complex data types. And you know everything from connections, this connection to the internet is a data type. Um, all data has a type. And it's important to know what kind of data type something is sometimes. Um, so knowing how to use type is very useful. So we've gone over numbers. Um, and I'm going to do a quick check to make sure nobody is freaking out. Nobody's freaking out. Good. OK. Uh, and to people watching this in the future, I occasionally have to check the chat, which is why you'll see me pause every once in a while. So. Now that we have gone over, now that we've gone over numbers, let's go over strings. Um, a string is just a series of characters, so essentially it's text. Uh, the reason it's called a string is because it that's literally what it is. It actually comes from, I think, typesetting, when they used to make um, actual like long pieces of paper to put down on bigger pieces of paper uh, to make like books and newspapers and stuff that was called a string. It was a line of text. So to make a string, you use either double quotes or single quotes. So hello world. Um, and note that when Python spits back just a string, it will spit it back with always with single quotes. It's just what it does. Um, you can use double quotes or you can use single quotes, um, your choice. And places have style guides about this. Um, there's usually, your company will usually prefer one or the other um, and it swaps around. So I don't, I don't really worry about it too much. Um, just try to be consistent within your own code because it makes it look prettier. And that's more important than you might think. Um, one thing to watch out for, if you mix quotes, you're gonna get an error. Um, if you ever get syntax error EOL while scanning string literal, um, that just means I was trying to read a string and it just kind of didn't have a, it didn't stop. It just kept going until the end of the file. Python will not make any assumptions. Um, it's looking for a matching quote. Some of the things we can do with strings. So I'm going to save a string to a variable and I'm going to save name equals Chloe. I should probably be able to spell my own dog's name, Chloe. And so if we say, what's a name? It's Chloe. If we say print name, it returns Chloe without quotes, because we actually said print this value to the screen. Um, we can find out the length of name by use doing, using len and then variable. 
five, so it's five characters long. Now, len, um, len is called a built-in, and there's a bunch of different functions in Python that it's like these bu nice built-in functions you can access, and you'll see more of those as we go along. Type is another one. That's another built-in. It's really useful to know what all these built-ins are and to occasionally look them over because sometimes they save you a lot of effort. They're also more readable because other Python people know what they do, so we don't have to figure out what the heck you're trying to do. Now you can do, um, you can do math with strings. It's more limited, but you can do it. So if we say Chloe plus dog, we get Chloe dog, but all smooshed together. Um, and that's just like what it does. It doesn't assume you want a space, it smooshes everything together. So if I wanted to actually put a space in there, I'd have to like actually put a space. So we'd have Chloe plus a string, Chloe plus a space plus a dog. That gives us Chloe dog. You can also multiply, which I find more useful than you'd think. Because all it does is it takes that string and it repeats it that many times. So if you say, um, hello times five, it says hello five times. I use this quite a bit in formatting. If I want to put like nice little line under something, that's what I do. Um, it's something because I kind of like my output to look pretty and to have, you know, headers between stuff. Um, so... But those are the two things. You can't do any other kind of math that I, that I can think of. So for instance, if I want to say Katie minus K, you get another error. Um, and we are going to go over errors later because later, errors are interesting. Um, whenever you get an error, it's called a traceback because it's literally tracing back through your code. But this last line says, what kind of error? Type error, unsupported operand types for minus, string, and string. This is basically saying, you told me to subtract these two things, and I don't know how to do that. Python does not make any assumptions. It does not try. Um, it's just going to spit out an error. So I'm going to, let's see, we've been going for half an hour. Um, I'm going to take a very quick break so I can drink water so I don't get all froggy and so people can get caught up. And I'll be back in five minutes. Okay, I'm coming back sooner than I thought because I want to see what my stream health is. Do, do, do. Ah, stream health is excellent. Good. Going back to my break. All right. So let me get my notes back up. Hopefully the stream health will stay up. Okay. So the next thing I want to go over are Boolean operators. Um, they sound super scary. Um, they're a new data type. But they're really not. All Boolean means is true or false. Like, literally, that's the only two values that a Boolean can be, true or false. So to show you how this works, I'm going to open up the Python REPL. Oh, and by the way, the REPL you might also see um, referred to as the shell, um, as the inter interactive Python, as there's a few other ways that we refer to it. Um, so in the REPL, just going to type capital T true. And all it spits back is true. And if I do capital F false, capital F false. Now these two things are very important because the basis of every program is based on a series of is or isn'ts. Uh, you know, you can have like a bunch of stuff where you print out stuff and you have data, but eventually in order to make it be more useful, you have to do something if something is true or, you know, while something is true or if something is false or while something is false. So it's important to understand Booleans because that's when programs really start to take off. So first, before we can do that, we have to understand Booleans. So... This is basically true or false are boolean. So if you do type true, class bool. 
Um, but if you do lowercase, by the way, you get a name error, name true not defined. It has to be capital T true and capital F false. That's what they have to be. So one of the ways you get Booleans is you compare one thing to another, and there are special operators for that. To see if two things are equal, you use two equal signs. It may not be clear on the stream, but that's two equal signs. So one equal to, is one equal to one? Yes. Is one equal to two? It is not. Um, you can also see if something is not equal to something. You know, is one not equal to two? It is not. One is equal to one, so this one fails. And that is an exclama exclamation point and an equal sign. That is not equal to. You can also see if something is greater than or less than, um, just using the angle brackets. And if you want to see if something is greater than or equal to, use a greater than, equal to, and then an equal sign. And that's the same for less than and equal to. So pretty, you know, pretty basic. Those are the operators that you really want to that you really want to know. Um, and that's how we can compare like pretty much anything as long as you can compare the two things. So we've compared a bunch of numbers. You can also compare strings. So these two strings are equal. These are not, and the reason they're not, there's a space after this kitty. So when Python says, are two things equal? It means, are they absolutely equal? Um, it will not like say, eh, close enough. Python is a very yes or no, and all programming languages are pretty much yes or no. JavaScript has some moments when they're not, but this is pretty much like, you know, it has to be exactly equal. Now you can also chain. Um, you wanna test for a bunch of things, you can actually chain them together. Um, and for this one, I'm just going to say true or false instead of writing out a bunch of expressions, which this is an expression. Um, I'm just going to write out true for a little bit of shorthand. So the first way you can chain a bunch of expressions together is using the AND statement. And the way AND works is, is that every if everything if everything in that expression is true, it returns true. If even one thing is false, it returns false. So you could have a hundred trues and one false, and it will return false. Everything has to be true. Now, the other one is or. And with or, only one thing has to be true. So here we have true or false or false, and it returns true because one thing was true. Um, but if we have false or false, it returns false. So just a shorthand, with and, everything has to be true. With or, only one thing has to be true. Um, now, one funny thing about these the way Boolean expressions like this work, the compound ones, is the second something is false, it exits. Uh, which is kind of important to know. I've run across that every once in a while if I have a bunch of them. Um, but as soon as something is false, it exits. So it'll go through each one. But as soon as something is false, it's like, done, I'm out. So you can combine and and or. But just, you know, think through it, like what order it's going to go in. You can also use not. And not just flips. Um, it flips the Boolean. So not false is true. Not true is false. And this is more important later on um, when you're working with more complex systems. I don't use this in some of the basic Python scripts that I use, that I write where it's pure Python. I use this a ton when I'm working with Django um, because sometimes it just makes for more readable code, but there's also times when I'm looking for, you know, you know, something doesn't exist or, you know, there's all kinds of like weird use cases that you come across. It's one of those things that's important to know in the back of your mind that this is something that can be done, but you're probably not going to use it right away. Yeah, I'm going to check the stream health. Doesn't like my resolution. Well, too bad. I'm not going to mess with that right now. 
So, also, if you're coming from Python 2, there may have been some things you're used to comparing, um, but you can only you can't compare stuff that can't be ordered. That's a caveat only for people that are used to Python 2. Python 3 people, don't worry about it. So why are we going through all these booleans? I'm going to get out of here, control D, and go back to my workspace. The reason we're going through all this is because we have um, ways in Python of doing something if something is true. And that's an if statement. So in order to do an if statement, you're going to have to learn about something called blocks. So first thing I'm going to do is set name to gizmo. Um, so all I'm doing is setting a variable. And an if statement looks like this. If some kind of expression. And this won't run, this is pseudocode. So if some sort of expression, um, do some code here. Now what you'll notice is that it indented code, code. This is called a block. Blocks are extremely important in Python because it is how we say that this code um, is special. It's only run at a certain time. Because otherwise, Python will go down and run every bit of code that is here, that is right against, right flush against the side. Once it's indented, um, it knows that there's some special circumstance around this code. So this code would belong to the if expression. Yeah, I know, this isn't real code. Um, if this expression is true, run this code. Then run this code, no matter what. So let's exchange this pseudocode, which means not real code. Print hello grumpy, because he's very grumpy. All right, no, go forward. Er, I hate that shortcut, no. Sorry, everyone, let me open it back up. I totally need to, I never actually use that. I just need to get rid of that shortcut. Anyway, let's go over what this code is doing. Um, I take the variable name and I set it to gizmo. And I say, if the name is equal to gizmo, print hello grumpy, print how are you, and then print done. So let me run this. And I'll bring this up so everybody can see it. So it says, hello grumpy, how are you, and then done. Now if I change this to Chloe, and I run it, it just prints done. So let's walk through what happened here. So when it was gizmo, Python went and it checked to see if the value in name was equal to gizmo. And since it was, it printed, hello, grumpy, how are you? And printed done at the end. When it was Chloe, when it was Chloe, it checked to see if the name was equal to gizmo. Chloe does not equal gizmo. So it skipped this code. It didn't even worry about it. And it went straight down to here and printed done. So let me see, make sure that makes sense for everyone. Do, 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 no questions. Cool. All right. So that's basically, you know, basic if statement. Now that's fine, and I use these, but sometimes you want to run something, like if something is true, then do X, otherwise do Y. So to do that, you add an else clause. So just like a sentence, you have a sentence and then you have a clause in a sentence, that's kind of what this is working like. It's the grammar, print,
Hello, other dog. And if we run this, it says, hello, other dog. So let's walk through what happened here. The variable name has the value Chloe. The first thing Python does is sees if the value in name is equal to gizmo. Chloe does not equal gizmo. So it goes down to the else statement and it prints hello other dog and then it prints done. So, you know, that is an if statement with an else clause. Now another thing we can do is add an elif. Elifs are great. You can check for a bunch of things. So elif name equals Chloe print hello little dog and we'll run this and see what happens. So we set the name to Chloe. The first thing we check to see does the name equal Gizmo? It does not. The next thing we check to say to see is, does the name equal Chloe? It does. So we print this line and then exit the if statement. And that's important to know. Um, this catches people quite a bit, is that it will go through and check each elif, and each if and elif to see if something is true. And once something is true, it skips the rest. It completely like skips it. So I've seen people, and I've done it myself, where I met one condition, and but another condition also would have been true, and I exited too early. So that's important to keep in mind is that once it hits something that's true, it skips the rest of it. So um, an if statement always requires an if. It can have as many elifs as you want. It can only have one else. So that's important to remember too. Um, and you don't require any of these. Like you can just have, as I showed you, just plain old if statement. It's also important to have your indentation. If you are working in Cloud9 or Sublime or any smart editor, it will always put that indentation in for you. However, if you're working in one that's not as smart, you need to put it in yourself. And the best idea is to actually to use four spaces. Don't use your tab key. Um, put in four spaces or, or figure out how to override in your specific IDE how to say when, you, when I hit tab, I really mean four spaces because tabs are evil. Um, they mess up when you go between systems, just don't do it. So the next thing we're going to go over is input. I'm erasing all of that, actually, here. I'll keep that. No! See, I actually forget I'm in an editor and not in like just my regular Windows. So I will do that on occasion. I'm just going to create a new file. Yeah, go ahead and save it. File, new. I'm going to save this one as input examples. So if you worked in Python 2, this is the second major thing you might run into. Um, there used to be something called raw input that no longer exists in Python 3. You only use input. And what input does, it's a way to get data from the user. Now, there are many ways to get data from a user. You can have them on a website entering in data, and there's all of this magic that happens that will get the data to you, to the Python script. Um, they might be using a graphical interface, a GUI, um, and entering in the data there. We might be talking to an API. We may be, it's all kinds of different ways. Um, but the most basic way to do it is using input. So that's usually the first thing you use. So let's do a quick input example. And I'm going to put meal. I'm going to create a variable, a variable called meal and just say input, and then print meal. So I can close this window. I can close this window. I'm going to run. 
and it just seems like it's hanging there. But if I type breakfast, ah! Did I do something wrong? I'm gonna copy and paste this to make sure my thing isn't messed up. Okay, I think I just need to run those codes again, apparently. Shouldn't have had to, but... Hold on a sec, just setting my... everything back up to the way it should be. Oh, I see what I did. I told you I was going to do this eventually. Needs to be in parentheses. Let's try to run this again. Okay, so what happened here? Um, input basically waited for somebody to give it input, and I had to type something in and press enter, and then it printed out what I what I put in. Um, let's see what type of data that is. So let's run it again. It's a string. Input only accepts strings. Um, you can put other kinds of data in there, but you're gonna have to convert it. Um, strings are rather safe because when you get them, you can do a whole bunch of checks against them to make sure that they're okay, that you can do what you want with them. So, let me go back to my notes where I was. So if you wanna convert it, like let's say, num equal num equals input print num um, print num and the type of num we'll run this real fast make sure it works so if I give it a five it's a string we can't do math like we want with a string so what we can do is say num is equal to int num print num type num. Okay. So what happened here? Input got a string and we use the built-in int to convert that string into a number. Um, this is a very naked and trusting way of doing this because one thing that users can do is if I say five, it's going to throw an error. Now there are ways that we'll learn later um, how to actually convert stuff, um, but just know that int is one of the ways to convert a string into a number, which is important to know if you're going to use input. Now, the whole hanging there thing is kind of annoying, where it just kind of waits, um, where you think, oh god, I broke Python. Well, there's a way to get around that, and I'm going to say meal equals input. You can put a prompt in here. What meal do you like? Print meal. If we run this now, oh. So it begins. I'm going to keep screwing that up. I like breakfast. It prints out breakfast. So that's just a prompt. Um, I find that you use input less and less the more you program because you start using more complex interfaces. Um, so I use Django a lot. I use Pygame. I use stuff like that. So you just kind of stop using input as much, but it's really important to know how it works because when you're beginning, that is mostly how you're going to get input from users. Um, so one of the big lessons about input is one, you can add a prompt. Two, it only returns strings. And three, um, users should never be trusted. So when you convert things later on, we're going to go over ways like how to test if something should be converted. Um, and actually we'll be doing that next is we'll be playing with input and while loops. Um, so don't trust your users, never trust your users. All right, I'm gonna take a quick five minute break so I can get more coffee and I'll be back in five minutes. 
All right, I have coffee, so let's move on to while loops. So we went over if loops, and if loops will run, let me create a new file, new file, So, if loops, if statements run um, basically straight through. Um, if something's true, it does it, it exits, or just it doesn't do anything. Um, they just run once, run through once. A while loop will run while something is true, so it'll keep repeating. So, let's do a quick example, just so I can show you how this works. Um, I'm going to set i to zero while i is less than 10 print i i equals i plus one and then print done Let's close this window. We no longer need you. Let's run. So here's the result. I is equal to zero. Um, it goes through and it keeps running those two lines until something is false. So we start off with zero. While I is less than 10, zero is less than 10. Print out whatever's in I, add one to I. Go back to the top of the loop. Now I is one. One is less than 10, print I add one to it, go back to the top, and it'll keep doing that over and over and over again until i until i less than 10 returns false, and then it'll continue with the rest of the program. It's important to understand while loops pretty well because every program pretty much that you touch is a loop. It, you know, everything is in one loop. Um, because if you think about it, when you open a browser, um, it only closes when you hit the close button, hopefully. Um, so that's a loop, that's a program loop. Basically, while the user doesn't wanna quit, you know, keep going, keep bringing up websites, um, you know, in games, you know, it, does, they don't, it doesn't automatically shut down when it's like you defeat the end boss or you die, it will do something else. It'll only close down when you decide to close it. So all programs are basically one big loop and there's loops inside loops. So understanding how loops work is super important. So this is a basic while statement. Um, there are also some things you can add into while loops. So let's see. Um, actually, we can bring that back. Let me think, print i if i is equal to five, break. Let's run. This time it only went up to five. What break does is said break the loop. Get out of the loop that you're in and go back to the program. Um, and it'll just break out of this loop. Break is really important to understand because sometimes um, there's too much here to like test for that you may have 30 different things that can break that loop and that's not uncommon um, I had a program once where you had to take in data from a feed pretty much any feed anywhere and you had to figure out what to do with it and you had to like make it clean and there were so many places where something could go wrong um, that you just use break statements just to say, okay, at this point, you know, I'm done. The thing is as clean as it's going to get break out. And that's why you'll often see in Python this while true, which it looks like this would not work. But the assumption is, is that you're going to have a break in there somewhere. So if I run this, works just fine because once I is equal to five, we break, we break out of the loop. Now what happens if I remove these lines? 
and let's see what I let's see what Cloud Nine does with this. It just keeps going. Uh, uh, yeah, close it there. Um, that's called an infinite loop, and you don't want those in general. Um, you don't want things to run forever. You want some kind of way to get out of a loop. So I'm going to bring back that code. But that's called an infinite loop. If you get in it in, caught in an infinite loop in the REPL, you can hit Control C or Control D. One of them works. Um, if it's in a program, like it's running separately, you just kind of have to kill it, um, which you may you actually use the kill command. You'd have to look up how to do that on each system. Um, but yeah, infinite loops are bad. And a lot of systems now will catch infinite loops and they'll start freaking out that this is this thing is caught in an infinite loop. You might see that on your browser occasionally, that your browser will say, this is caught in an infinite loop. It's just not responding. You know, I'm not going to show this. I'm not going to show this page. So that is one thing you can do. Another thing you can do is continue. So if I is equal to three, we're going to reorder this a little bit. So the first thing we need to do is always make sure that we add one, because we want to make sure that this could execute. If i is equal to 3, continue. We'll run this. And it prints out 1, 2, 4, 5. Now what happened here? Continue just means skip the rest of the code in the loop, go back to the top now. Continue is really important to understand too. This, these are the two things that make while loops really sync. While loops are great, but with break and continue, they become super useful and super flexible. So. What happened here? We set i to 0. While true, we're just going to go to this loop until you break out of it. i equals i plus 1. We add 1 to i, which is why we didn't get a 0 this time. If the i, if whatever is in i is equal to 3, continue. Go back to the top of the loop. What does that skip? It skips this. It skips the printing, and it skips the break. So. That's one of those useful things that if you hit a condition and you just want to move on to the next thing, that's like really useful. Um, I use this all the time when I'm like going through a bunch of things and I know that if I hit a certain thing, I don't want to do the rest of the processing, that I don't want to waste my cycles doing it or I know that it'll have an error. So I just go back to the top of the loop. So to sum up, a while loop will run while something is true. You can either just say true up here or you can use an expression They'll, it'll test the expression, but the true will just keep going. Um, continue um, tells the program to go back to the top of the loop, and break tells the program to break out of the loop that it's in. So those are while loops. Now the next thing we're going to go over is lists. Lists are great. Um, they are an extremely useful data type and they are exactly what they sound like. Lists are basically lists of items. If you're coming from other languages, you may be used to lists like needing, you know, we need to say how many things are in the list or how many like, um, like, okay, how many things are in the list or, um, you know, what type of things in the list. Python doesn't care. It will put anything in a list. And the way we create a list, let me save this. My list example. Um, my list equals, actually I'll do colors. Colors equals red, yellow, blue. That is how you create a list um, that already has things in it. So it's square brackets. Um, the square brackets are at the end of the top row of keys if you're using a QWERTY keyboard. Um, and each value is separated by a comma. You can also create an empty list. Nums equals this. So you can also create an empty list. You see this, you see this in programs more than you see this 
because often what you want to do is create a list and then add things to it. So here we have colors. I'm going to print colors. And the way you add things to a list, colors.append purple. So colors dot append. Um, this is called a method and it's a special kind of thing you can do to object to um, variables, some variables, and you're going to see it quite a bit. And it's important to know that they exist, but not necessarily like we're not going to get in depth into what they are right now. It'll make more sense later. Just know that this is a thing you can do. So colors dot append the value purple print colors. And let's run this and see what happens. So the first thing we print out is red, yellow, blue. Then we appended purple and now the list has red, yellow, blue, purple. So that is how you add things to a list. You use append. You can also get values out of a list. So what you do is you have the variable name followed by a bracket, an integer, another bracket. So let's see what this does. Run it. Oh. <sighs> no. Prints out yellow because every item in a list has an index. And all the index is, is it says this is its place in the list. So we always start at zero. Most programming languages start counting at zero. And there's all kinds of math and stuff that explain why this is. But just know that we always start counting at zero. Also, if you've ever gotten an email from somebody that's making a list and they start it with zero, um, you know they're probably a programmer. Um, so red is at index zero. Yellow is at index one. And blue is at index two. So that's why when we printed colors one, we got yellow. It said, in the list colors, get me whatever's in one. We can also set that value again. So colors of one is now going to be equal to um, puce. And let's run this. So the first thing we got, it said we printed out colors, red, yellow, and blue. We changed the value in index one. So we changed yellow to puce, and now the colors are red, puce, blue, which is ugh. Let me check the health real fast. All right, looks like everything's going well. Check chat. Okay. All right. So some other things you can do, and I'm going to get rid of the rest of this. Um, so we learned about index. We learned about appending. Um, we can also see if a value is in a list. Print red in colors. This is really useful. True. What in does, in as a keyword, it just says, is this value in this list? And Python will go through the list and make and see if that value is in the list. I use this so often. Um, but it does look for an exact value. So if you have capital R red and you run this, both of these will return false because capital R red is not in the list. It's lowercase red. But this is super useful. And in Python, this is also optimized. So this is kind of what you probably want to use if you want to see if something is in the list. Um, let's see. And slicing. Slicing is neat. Slicing is something that I grew to love uh, the more I worked in Python. And I'm going to add in some more colors. Purple, 
Wide. As I try to remember my Roy G. Biv. Orange. Yellow. Green. Blue. Purple. Okay. Here are our colors. Slicing is really what it sounds like. You are getting a slice of a list. Um, and there's three ways to do it. Going to print first colors from one to three. Four, and I'm just gonna type these out and then I'm gonna explain what they're doing. Oop, oop. Let me run this. Okay, so now quick review. Um, red is at zero, so zero, one, two, three, four, five. When we say print colors one to three, we mean start at orange, start at orange, which is an index one, this is index two, so it goes just up to three. It does not include three. So if we wanted to include green, we'd need to make this four. And I'll be honest, I use this probably the least often. I think I even have to like look up occasionally to remember if it includes it or not. I use these two much more often. What this is, is it says start at index four, so zero, one, two, three, four, and give me everything from that index to the end. So start at four, go to the end. The other one says start at the beginning and keep going until index three. So zero, one, two, and then there's three. It, it does not include three. Um, I use the last two much more, and actually I use this middle one the most, because there are many cases where I'm like, I know I don't want to include the first row um, I don't want to include the first thing because it's just a header or it's just something special. So I want to exclude that. Um, so that is how you slice a list. And it's one of those things that you use more and more, the more you code, the more you become comfortable with it. I didn't use it at first. And then I just kind of slowly one day realized that I was using slices everywhere. So that is how you do a slice. It's also important to know sometimes if you're even if you're not going to use them, what these look like. So it's important to say, OK, I know what this looks like. I know what they're trying to do. Um, so you don't go, what the heck? Why is this? This isn't, you know, appropriate. But it is. It, it works. So let's go over now that we have been working with lists. Oh, I'm not going to delete my list. Worked hard on that for loops, and I'm going to look at the chat really fast. Nothing else. OK. So for statements, for statements are another kind of loop. And unlike while loops, which is kind of run forever, a for loop will run for every item in a list or in a range. Um, so this is what it looks like. I'm just going to type it up. I'm going to run it. We're going to talk about it. So colors is a list. It has a bunch of colors in it. The for loop, this is what they look like. For a variable in a list, do stuff. So print that color. And what this does, now this is a really common, you'll see this a lot in Python, like list will be plural because it should have more than one thing. And we'll use the singular here. You do not need to call it color. You know, it does not need to be a singular. Python doesn't care. This is readability. This is for humans. Um, but this is usually the pattern that works the best for most people. Um, so what happens? It says, OK, I have a list. I'm going to take the first value, store it in the variable color, and then I'm going to work with that. I'm going to print color. Then once I'm done with my loop, I'm going to go back to the top, and I'm going to say, I'm going to take the second thing in the list and put it in color and run the loop. And it's going to keep doing that until it runs out of things. And then it will continue with the rest of the program. So I'm going to print done down here, just so you can see that. 
So it prints out all the colors and then it prints out done. And for loops are super useful um, because often you have a list where you want to run through each part of the, each item in the list. You can also use break and continue with for loops. So first I'll do the continue. If the color is equal to yellow, continue. We'll run this. As you can see, yellow is not printed because once yellow was stored in color and color is equal to yellow, we go back to the top of the loop and we do not print out the color. We can also use break. If color is equal to blue, break. And we only get red, orange, and green because red is stored into color. It's not yellow. It's not blue. We print it. Orange, not yellow, not blue. We print it. Yellow, it is yellow. We go back to the top of the loop. Green, not yellow, not blue. We print it. Um, blue, not yellow, is blue. So we end the loop. We never print. We never even work with purple. We just stop. Um, this seems kind of arbitrary and silly. It's not when you have a huge set of data um, that you're working through. And sometimes like the in statement is really good for saying, is this thing in a list? But sometimes you have a more complex thing you want to look for. Like, are these three things true and these two things false? Um, does it meet certain requirements? Um, did I hit something where I know that everything is going to error out after this? When you're doing more complex, like playing with more complex data, knowing how to use continue and break correctly saves you. Um, a ton of code because you can just check for something and get out of there um, instead of having to do all these complex weird nested nested crap this will save you from and when I say nested um, you can have like these are nested the if loop is nested in the for um, and trust me it can get deep and you don't want that because it becomes unreadable and unmanageable don't do it so those are four statements. And one good thing to know with four statements is range. Um, if you worked in Python 2, range is another thing that's different. Um, you used to be able to just use range, but now you can't. So let's see. I'm going to show you how to use range now. So range. list range. I'm going to start at 0 and at 100. Run. So let's talk about what we're doing here. It's I'm this is not one of those things that I'm a fan of in Python 3. I know they had reasons for it. I read the blog post. I still hate it um, because I think that it's, you know, kind of opaque. Basically, what this line is doing, it's creating a list out of a range between 0 and 100. It's going to stop just short of 100. Um, so if you see this list down here, it starts at 0 and it goes all the way up to 99. You can also step this. So 0, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, it goes up by 5. Um, and it stops when it gets to like 100. And this can be useful because you can use it this way. For i in list, don't even need to save it to another variable, you can just use it. Print Makes a little pyramid. So we have a range um, from, it's going to be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And each time we go through the loop, we print out an equal sign times i. So we have 0, then we have 0, and then 1, then 2, then 3. Nice little way to make a little pyramid y thing. 
a triangle, not pyramid, triangle. So that is one way you'll often use range. So let's see, we're at 11 o'clock and I'm going to really quickly look to see when this meet up, how long it's supposed to be. Do, do, do. To 12.30, okay, good. We are doing good. Um, some of the next things we're going to be working on are dictionaries, which are another data type, which I like quite a bit. Functions, which is storing chunks of code to run again and again. We'll go over some modules, and then we'll go over what's next. For now, um, let's see. You know what, I think I'll go over dictionaries. I will. We'll go over dictionaries, and then I will take another break. Save this file. Dictionary examples.py. So what is a dictionary? Well, a dictionary in real life is some kind of word paired with a definition. Dictionaries in Python are a key paired with a value, and they are really, really useful to like know how to use. Um, I use them constantly because they are just, they're super, super useful. Um, this is what a dictionary looks like. Let me make a very basic one. Um, so I'm going to make one called pets and gizmo is a schnauzer. And you don't have to like press enter. Uh, this is just to make the code look nice. Chloe is a Jack Russell. And Hannah is a grade schooler. That's my, that's my second grader. So those are my pets. And my husband's laughing because I made Hannah a pet. But there's a reason I did that. So... Let's, no, there, get there, print pets, print my pets out. Let's go here and let's run this. So I just printed Gizmo, Schnauzer, Hannah, Grade Schooler, Chloe, Jack Russell. So for these, the first thing is the key. And the important thing to know about keys is they are unique. Um, you can only have one key for each value in a dictionary. Value goes with the key, so key, value, values over here. With values, that's the value associated with the key. And values don't have to be unique. So we have Gizmo the Schnauzer, Chloe the Jack Russell, and Hannah the Grade Schooler. Um, another thing to note down here, uh, which I'm glad it did this, it doesn't always do it. Remember how lists, lists everything is in an order. Zero, one, two, three, four, five. It will always stay in that order until you mess with it. Dictionaries don't care about order. They just don't. You know, you could get, you could actually get this dictionary like back a different way. Um, it's important to remember that dictionaries are not in a certain order by default, and they don't care about what order you created them in. So that can trip up some people when they try to use dictionaries in a way they shouldn't. And there is something called order dictionaries. Don't worry about them right now. So to get values out of a dictionary. Let's say we want to print. We just want to see what gizmo is. Looks kind of like a list. Um, you use the variable name, a bracket, but instead you put in the key that you want, the key of the value that you want. So let's run it. And this time it prints out schnauzer. Um, so that's how you get a value out. You can also set a value. So pets of gizmo is equal to miniature schnauzer. So let's run this because we want to be more accurate, because there's three kinds of schnauzers. Um, first we had it that it was a schnauzer, and then we set 
pets to Gizmo to be a miniature schnauzer, and now we have miniature schnauzer. So that's how we would change the value associated with the key. Now, so other things we can do, we can also say, what are all the keys in a dictionary? So this is another thing. If you're a Python 2 person, it's going to look a little different. Print list pets keys. So what this is doing, pets.keys with the parens um, says, get me all the keys that are in pets and list just converts that into a list. So we have a list of Hannah, Gizmo, and Chloe. We can also get all the values that way. So same thing, grade scholar, schnauzer, and Jack Russell. Those are all the values in my list. Now, if we wanna add, we're just gonna print pets again. If we wanna add a value to pets, all we have to do we don't have to use a pen or anything. We just say, what is the new key? The new key is going to be Jacob. And it's going to be equal to grumpy teen. So as you can see here, let me scroll, move my head real fast. There. So the first time, we had Gizmo the Schnauzer, Hannah the Grade Schooler, and Chloe the Jack Russell. And now at the end, we have Jacob the Grumpy Teen. So that is how you add a value. It's very simple. Dictionaries are easy to use. Um, they're very easy to use. So we have our pets, and let's say Hannah protests. And she's like, I am not a pet, I'm a human. Um, I hear this from her quite a bit when I call her a pet. So we're going to pop Hannah, print out pets again. So when you use pop, it finds that key and it removes that key value pair, it just goes away. So before we had Hannah the grade schooler, we had Hannah, Chloe, and Gizmo, and now we just have Chloe and Gizmo. Now we can also use dictionaries with for loops. So for pet in pets, let's just see what pet is. So what it does is it can, you can actually go through and it grabs each key. And so it's for each key, it just grabs that key and stores it into a variable. So we can even print out So for pet and pets, um, get the first key, store it in pet, print out pet, and print out the value for that key. Print out the key and the value for that key. So Gizmo, Schnauzer, Chloe, Jack Russell, Hannah, Grade Schooler. There we go. So you can use them with for loops. They are super useful. I highly recommend learning to use them. Um, just do remember that keys are unique. You can only have one because every time you set that key, you're just going to overwrite the value associated with that key. That is their power and that is the thing that can trip you up. So at this point, the next things we have to do are functions and modules and what next. I'm going to take a 10 minute break because um, my voice is getting a little froggy. So I'm going to drink my coffee, drink some water, um, and I'll be back in 10 minutes. So just to review, we've gone over quite a bit this morning. Um, we've gone over the difference between the REPL and working on a file, and we've been doing both. Um, we've gone over how to use print, how to do some math with numbers, what strings are, how to do math with strings, Boolean, true or false, and how to compare two things to get a Boolean. If statements, including if, elif, and else, while loops, um, including break and continue, lists, so list of things, for statements, also including continue and break, range, which gives us a list of numbers, 
dictionaries this is the last thing we covered, which is basically kind of a list of key value pairs, but it's not actually a list list. Think of it as a collection, a bucket full of key value pairs. So now that we've gone over all of that, we, no, we don't want to save, that's fine. Um, now we are going to go over, I'm going to check the live dashboard. Okay, good, everything appears to be working again. We are going to go and start on functions. Functions are basically a bit of code that you can run over and over within a program. And they're useful so that you don't have to like, you can write code once and just run it again. Um, I, highly I highly recommend getting used to how they work because most of the time you're working within functions and you'll have one main function that kind of ties everything together. So let's create a function. So to create a function, First, you have to define it using def. This means I'm going to be defining a function. You have to give the function a name. And I'm going to call it hello. And we are going to need a block, so it's going to be indented. Now, you notice there's two parens after the hello. We'll use those in a minute. So all this is going to do is print hello there, print how are you? And then down here, I'm going to call it. And let's run this. So all this does is first Python goes through here. And it doesn't actually run any of this. Um, and to prove it to you, I'm actually I'm going to remove this for a moment going to run it. Just run it without doing anything. It doesn't do anything. Because what Python is doing is it's saying, okay, I'm going to create a function and I'm going to store it into memory so you can call it again. This is how we call it. We have the name of the function and then parentheses. And if you don't have the parentheses, I don't think this will show out here. Yeah, but it won't actually do anything. You have to say call the function because there are times when you don't want to call the function you may just be passing it around and doing all kinds of weird things with it that are a little more advanced but you have to say I want to call the function so define the function call the function um, this is fine I mean I will use a function like this if I want to print out a menu or something or a welcome screen that I don't really have anything that I need to do but print out a bunch of stuff However, many times you're going to want to pass stuff into a function. So here we're going to pass in name. And instead of saying hello there, I'm going to say hello, comma, name. Now let's run this and talk about what's going on here. So this time, we defined a function, and we say you should expect about one value, and I want you to store that value into the variable name. It's called a parameter. Um, this is the one of the things you're going to need in order to run. So store it into name. Then just do your code. So hello name, how are you? If we call hello with Katie, it says hello Katie, how are you? If I say use Jim. It says, hello, Jim, how are you? And you notice that it ran it twice. Like it said, hello, Katie, how are you? Hello, Jim, how are you? Um, and that's one of the beauties of functions is that you can use them multiple times. And in this case, you can even change what it does slightly. So what happens if we don't send a value? We get a trace back. Um, traceback, type error, hello, missing one required positional argument, name. This basically means you tried to call hello, I was expecting at least one value, 
um, you didn't send me anything, so I don't know what to do. Now, sometimes um, you do want people to send you values. So if you say, okay, you know, I always want this value and I want it to error out if I don't get anything, that's fine. But you can also set a default value. And this is how you set a default value. Where you define your parameter, you can say equal and then a value. And in this case, it's going to run just fine. It says, hello person, how are you? And if I call it with Katie, the first time it runs, it'll say, you know, hello, per you know, hello person, how are you? And if you send it a value, instead of using person, it'll store that value into name. And it uses that. So the first time, hello person, how are you? The second time, hello Katie, how are you? Um, so you can set defaults. With defaults, really do question whether you want to set a default or not, because there are certain things you don't want to set a default for, like, you know, a social security number, if you're really sure you want that number, an ID number. Um, so you don't always have to set defaults. Errors are not the enemy. Um, one of the things with Python is that we actually encourage, um, if you, like, if a program is going to fail, fail loudly fail extravagantly because it's much easier to debug. So don't try to hide all errors. Um, go ahead and fail. Now there are some errors that you want to catch and work around, but you only want like a specific kind, like I know that this kind of error is something that I'm looking for. Now we've gone through hello. Let's go through a different, a little bit different of a function and we are going to return a value. Uh, I'm gonna create a new one. Okay, function um, get double. And I'm expecting a num. Return num times num. Print doubling num. And I'm going to say that n equals, and I'm going to explain this in just a second, 5. Let's run it. So let's talk about what's going on here. I created a new function called get double. Get double expects a value to be sent to it, num. We print out doubling, then num. And we return num times num. Here, the call looks a little different. Here we have n equals get double, 5. Because when we return this value, it gets stored into n. And then we print out n. So you can see that we sent 5. We said we're doubling 5. We returned 5 times 5, which is 25, which was stored into n. And then we printed n, so 25 was printed out. Returning values is also super useful because you may have, like this is a really silly example, but if you have a very complex um, mathematical equation that you wanna go through, um, then you would wanna create a function for it. Or if you have something where there's a lot of like ifs and elses, need to check this and check that and see if these are equal and then return like the end of like the output, um, then you would want to create some kind of function to go through and do that. Because one advantage is, is that this is super easy to read. Blah. Get double is much easier to read than a bunch of code. So if I was going to say, like, get prime factors, there are equations you can go through to create get, to get prime factors um, of large numbers. And it's just, and if you're not like a, like in the math field, like, and you know, there's this whole myth like, oh, computer programmers are really good at math. I'm like, have you ever seen a bunch of programmers try to split a bill? We are not all good at math. Actually, we've gotten super lazy about math and we forget how to do it because we have computers doing it for us. So many of us have forgotten anything that we're not using in our job on a day-to-day -day basis. And finding prime factors is something I would 100% have to look up today. Um, 
So it's much easier to have a function called get prime factors rather than just having the, you know, all the code on the screen. Um, and it also allows you to redo it, like to reuse it. So you might have to get prime factors in four different places in your program, and you can just call one thing. So functions are awesome. Make lots of them. Now some fancier things you can do, and I'm trying to decide if I want to go through this. We have enough time. Functions can get fancy. So I'm going to first show you args. Def print args. And I'm going to call it uh, do, 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 do. print args one, two, three, four, five, no, five. There's the five. Let's see if this works. Okay. Args. Args is one of those things that I did not use at first when I first started programming, and it would have made my life a little bit easier to know what they were, and also easier when I moved on to things like Django. Because many people learn Python, like the basic Python, and then almost immediately will run off to a framework. And we'll go into those later. But, you know, whether it's Python or Pygame or Flask or any of these, you tend to run off to those. And you will see this, the single asterisk. And this is really the meat of what's going on here. What this is, is that I can send an arbitrary number of values into this function, and it'll be stored into a list called args. Um, so I can treat it just like a list. I think I may even be able to send nothing. Let me check. Yeah, you can send nothing. You could send 100 things. And it'll just start into a list and work with everything. So that's a really nice thing if you're not sure how many things are going to get sent in. Um, so if you have, like, you know, you want to do something with everybody's family members, but you don't know how many family members they have. Some people are a family of one. Some people have like, you know, eight, you know, big families, little families, all kinds of families, and you just want to do something with each family member. This is where you could use that. And this also, by the way, does not have to be called args. You could call it pets. You could call it apples. But args is what you're going to see people in the Python world call it most commonly. Now, another thing you can do, I'm going to delete all this, two asterisks, quargs. This strange word just means keyword args. So for keyword in keyword args, print keyword, and quargs of the keyword. And then we're going to call it print args, and we're going to say name equals Katie um, month equals June um, drink equals man Let's run it. So what this is doing is it's taking keyword arguments. So it's creating a dictionary instead of a list. This is the key. This is the value. So name, Katie. Month, June. Drink, Manhattan. So it just goes through and this is printing and this is actually nice if you need to have data that's a little more organized um, that you can just have keyword args that you know what kind of, you have a key that's associated with some kind of value. So that is how args and keyword args work. And I'm going to, and this is probably going to error out because I always forget how this works. One, two, three. Oh, pfft, need a comma, do, 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 comma. 
And we're now just going to print args, print keyword args. Let's see if this runs. Oh, pfft. Oh. Telling you, this was the one thing, the one major problem I have with Python 3 is they've changed how print works. So, you can send both args, you know, just arguments and then keyword arguments into a function. And this is one, if you do Django, you see this all the time. You see this on every view that you will write. This doesn't make sense to people who haven't played in Django yet, but trust me, this is like page two of the tutorial. You will see args and keyword args. So all it is, is it's saving everything that doesn't have a keyword into args, and it's saving anything with a keyword into keyword args. One of the things, you might get errors like, oh, they're in the wrong order or whatever, and you just muck with the order until it works. Because um, generally I put args first, then keyword args. But that is args and keyword args. I think when, let's add one parameter in here, num, and run it. So you can have, even have regular old parameters. The first thing we got, we stored into num. The second thing we, the next two things we got, they didn't have any keywords, so we stored them into args. And then we had something with the keywords, so we put that into keyword args. So this can make a very flexible function if you know you need these things. Some people just slap them on there so that their functions never like error out. I don't recommend that. Um, I recommend only doing it if you know that you need to do it, because otherwise it gets really hard to debug. And that is functions. I'll keep that up there. So now, now if you're if you're spacing out at args and keyword args, don't worry about it. Just keep simple functions and then come back and look at it later. Um, just kind of know what they do before you really start diving in deep. No shame in that. So when people talk about Python, they often say batteries included. Um, I think that was even our tagline on the website for a long time. And what they mean by that is that there's a lot of functionality in Python that is waiting for you to use it. Um, they're not all loaded immediately. Like there's a ton of stuff. And let me see if I can find that book, if it is at hand. Do, do, do. I don't see it anywhere. But I assure you, there is a book of all the Python modules that somebody went through and went through all the examples. Doug Hellman did this. The book is legit like this thick. Um, you could kill somebody with it if you wanted to. And there's just a lot of functionality beneath the surface. And I highly recommend taking a glance through the modules and getting to know what some of them do, because you don't want to have to rewrite the wheel. I assure you, people smarter than on this topic than any of us went through and wrote these modules and wrote the test, and they always work, and they work really well, and they're really well documented. So let's use a few modules. One of the first ones I like to show people how to do is use random. So this is what importing a module looks like. So I'm going to show and I'm just going to check before I move on. Nobody's chatting. Okay, good. Do, 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 do. All right. Is random. So import, actually, no, I'm going to go, I'm going to do this from the shell. Do, do, do. Much easier. Python, import random. Um, what I did here is I typed in random, and actually I'm going to redo that, import random. So you can see, um, this is the one way, well, this is one of the ways that you can import a module. You say import, name of the module. And here I'm going to do random, period, and then hit tab. Come on. And you'll actually see all the stuff you can do with it. And anything with like a little paren at the end of it, 
that is some kind of function you can call. It's actually called a method. Um, although I think in random, it's actually it actually is a function you're importing. It's this is totally like something you don't need to worry about. But these are all things you can do. Um, and random is like super mathy. This is actually a pseudo number random number generator. Um, random is like has a lot of complex math in it, but for the most part, you don't need to worry about a lot of that. Um, because I generally use um, randint and choice. Those are the two things that I use most often. So if I do random dot random, that gives me a random float in between zero and one, not inclusive. So it does not include zero and one. I don't think you can ever get them, but it's like a really long float in between. I don't use that a lot because I like randint. Random dot randint, and notice we're using the name of the module followed by a period, and then what we want to call. So randint um, one five. So it gave us a one. If we call it again, a four. Again, a three. And I'm just hitting the up arrow to get it to get that line again, and it will give us a, a random number between one and five, inclusive. So it will include one. It will include five. Um, and see, as you can see here, it got, I got one, I got five. So really useful if you're doing something like a dice simulator or trying to, you know, just get random numbers if you do game stuff. Um, so another thing you can use is random.choice. And here I'm going to have names equal, I'll do colors. Colors equals just a random red, yellow, blue. No. Oh blue. And if we do random dot choice colors gives you a random item from a list, which is super useful. I use this so often because I do a little bit of game development. Uh, actually, I do a lot of game development. That's my day job. Um, I just keep forgetting because they're like educational games. Um, so if you need to get a random choice from a list, like a random card or something, this is kind of how you do it. Um, some things that can be super useful. These are built-ins. If you do help and the name of the module that you've imported, you have to already have imported it, it'll open up the help on there and it will go through everything that you can do with this module. And it gives you like a nice reference that you can go to. Um, it goes through, and when you do it, if you hit space, it'll page down. If you hit the up and down arrow keys, you can just go up and down by lines. Um, it gives you classes. A lot of this is like really high level. Um, so you kind of just go down and find what you want. But choice is really useful if you're not in a place where you can Google. Um, it's good to know about because I do a lot of airplane coding um, and travel coding. And um, I often will not spend 15 bucks for them to give me crappy Wi-Fi. So I just, you know, I don't actually get that. Um, so you can read through all the things. And to get out of there, you press Q. That gets you out of there. You can also do dir random. This is one of the shortcuts I use really often because all it does is it says, this is all the stuff in random. Um, so it goes through and it shows like, you know, all the things, um, you know, it says others oh, shuffle and triangular. I use this when I know what I want, but I can't remember exactly like, was it state or get state? What was it called? Was there an underscore in there? This is something I just use from time to time when I can't remember exactly what it was called. Um, and while we're in there, aha, we have shuffle. So let's, let's see what, um, shuffle does help random dot shuffle shuffle takes one number or takes a thing um, method of random dot random instance shuffle list X in place and return none so let's try that we already have colors so random dot shuffle colors Let's see what's in colors now. It shuffled them. So if you're simulating a deck or something, this is a good way to do that, which I do quite often because we have matching games um, in our little thing, in the stuff I do at work. 
So another way to import, I'm actually going to close this and start it up again. Um, so we didn't import random, but that imports everything at random. And as we saw, there's a bunch of stuff in random. And many of the times you don't just want to import that thing. You want to say from this module, so from random, import um, rand int. Now when you call it, you don't call it like this anymore. You don't do that. Because this is going to fail. Watch. It'll fail. Now you just call rand int. So there's two ways, just to sum up, you can import the whole module by doing import module, or you can import just one or many things from a module saying from module import these things. So I could say rand int, comma choice, comma random, and it would import those three things. And it just depends on what you need at the moment. I prefer doing it this way if I can, where I import just one thing or a couple things because it's explicit. Um, and it shows like I'm using these things, but there are times when you want to import the whole thing. So neither way is wrong. Another cool thing, I'll show you another one, is calendar. Um, import calendar. Let's do the help on calendar just to get a real quick and our um, calendar printing functions. These are one of those, it's one of those things that doesn't have a lot of use um, once you've left, like, and done, and you're doing, like, web development or game development, but it's super useful if you're on, like, a terminal screen. Um, so it just prints out a calendar. And it has a bunch of examples of what, like, we have the calendar, um, format year, um, first day of the week is leap year, month, all these different things. PR Cal, or PR month, is what I normally use. So let me show you what that looks like. Calendar.PR month. And I want to print out, let's print out this month. So I think it's, two, um, forgetting the order, I think it's year 2016, month equals one. One And in this case, we don't start counting at zero because developers didn't lose their minds with calendars. Um, month equals one. Ugh. There we go. I remembered how it worked, finally. So we print the month, and this is the month of January. It starts on Monday, it ends on Sunday, and that's our month, I believe. So just one of those fun things. I actually use this a lot when I teach kids, um, and I have them find out what day of the week they were born. This is also a great way to find out what parents lied to me about their child's age, because you can see like what year is on their screen, um, which there's always a few. So that's calendar. It's just a fun little one that I like to use. Date time. When you use date time, it'll almost be like that. From date time, import date time. This is really common. You will find libraries that have things in them that are the same name as a library. That's just, it's a really common pattern. I find it easier to do it this way. So from date time, import date time. What is date time? It is a way to do um, lots of calendar and clock math, which is a lot harder than you'd think it is. Um, because I remember one of the things that we had to do when I was first learning to program is we had to figure out if it, if a year was going to be a leap year, which was kind of hilarious because it was the you know late 90s. This Y2K was actually becoming a concern um, in the public eye, and so we were taught like you know here's the function for figuring out if something is a leap year, and it was, it was complex. You know, it wasn't necessarily that easy. I mean, it was kind of like looking back, okay, I could work through the code, uh, but there's so much about dates and times and math that you don't want to do again. So if there's any module you sit down and you learn inside and out, make it be date time. So date time is actually quite easy to use. So if I do date time dot now, it gives me this. So actually let me say n equals date time dot now. 
This is called a date time object. And all that means is that we have an object, um, which you probably have heard, many people have heard of object oriented programming. It sounds super scary. The material on it can be super scary. It's actually not very scary. <laughs> Like it's not that bad until you get to the real complex stuff. It just means I'm going to collect a bunch of values and functions and put them together into one, co one cohesive unit. So if I hit end tab, I can see if you ignore all these things with the double underscores, you can see we have a bunch of things and some of them may not make any sense, but some of them do like end date or end day is 24. It's the 24th. Like this is all this is, is the year, the month, the day, the hour, the minute, the seconds, and milliseconds. So end day, end month is one, and hour 16. Um, and that's just for now. Daytime now literally gets what time is it right now? You can also create a date time. So let's see, we will make one for the 31st. So D equals date time, uh, where the month equals one, the day equals 31, the year equals 2016. Okay, so now we have years 2016, month is one, day is 31, and the rest is zeroed out because I didn't give it that information. And we can find, like, is it a weekday? Or what day of the week is it? Six. Um, this, I think, let me actually pull up a calendar. See when the 31st, because this is one of those things I also have to look up. Um, yes, a six is Sunday. Um, that is the, so a six is Sunday, a zero is Monday. So this is just saying, oh, it's a, you know, this day of the week is on a Sunday. So you can find out like what day of the week it is, um, all kinds of stuff. So this is one of those ones, as I said, get to know. Um, you can also do math. So we have N, which was now a few minutes ago, and D, which is the 31st. If we say N minus D, D minus N, the other way. Okay. We get a time delta, which is another kind of object. Basically says, you know, what's the difference between these two dates? And if we say diff equals D minus N, diff dot days, there's six days difference. Diff dot hours. Oh, it's minutes. Diff dot seconds. Um, there's different ways you can figure out like what's the difference between these two dates. And that's another thing you do not want to have to do this math on your own. Calendars are hard. We've only mostly got them figured out. We still have to mess with them like every once in a while um, and add seconds here and there, microseconds. So don't try to do calendars on your own. Learn date time. Okay, it's 11.45. What is the next module? All right. Um, URL lib, JSON, CSV. I'll just talk about some of these. Um, and all I'm doing is making sure I'm grabbing the right one. Okay. Um, URL lib is a really great way for talking to the internet. Now there are better ways to do it, but I highly recommend learning URL lib first um, so that you can learn how that works. So when you move on to something that's more advanced, then you kind of understand the nuts and bolts. Um, and you can also appreciate like all the work that goes into these like higher level modules that they make your life so much easier. Um, but learning the nuts and bolts is actually a really good thing. And like we can say import URL lib. Um, 
s equals url lib dot url err now nah, we're not going to mess with that i'm going to have to look everything up um because it's not one i use often but it's one i recommend people take a little bit to learn um json json is a very common format for data on the internet so if you have so for example, I think I have the Pokemon API. Poke API. So this, and yes, this is one of my favorite APIs to show off because it doesn't require any authentication or anything. And it's really easy to like understand what you're seeing here. So this and it's basically an API. It's a database full of all the information about Pokemon. This is JSON. It actually should look kind of familiar because it basically looks like a dictionary. And it is. And this is just a way to send data between websites or to store it somewhere. And it's super common. Some people complain about it, but it doesn't keep it from being super common. So um, you can combine JSON and URL lib to get data from other sites and use them in your scripts pretty easily. So this is these are two things that it's really fun to play with. Um, CSV, if you ever work in Excel, which if you have any kind of government related job or you deal with accounting or anybody like that, everybody wants a spreadsheet. No matter how much you're like, hey, I can put that in a database for you. No, they want a spreadsheet. And knowing how to use CSV makes your life a whole lot easier because what CSV does is it reads from spreadsheets or writes two spreadsheets. Um, CSV is a format for spreadsheets called comma separated variables. And you can import those into Excel or Google Docs, pretty much anything. It's a, just an open format. Um, super useful to know and get used to. And finally, and trust me, I'm a ton of them. These are just the ones that I tell beginners to look into is SQLite 3. Python 3, SQLite, I think this is the right, no, I went 3, it's somewhere in there, ah, there we go, um, we'll just look at Doug's, SQLite 3 is there's a database called SQLite. It's open source, it's free. It is also the easiest database you will ever set up on your system. Um, you literally just download it. And so you don't have, you've, if you've ever worked with databases, you have to like start services or start something up. It doesn't work like that, it's just flat files. It's awesome. Um, and if you wanna learn databases, I recommend starting here. And because it's really easy to learn, it's so easy to set up. Everything has it. Um, if you were going to do Android or Android development, or even I think iOS development, they use SQLite 3. So start there. This SQLite 3 is the module that you use in Python to talk to a database, to talk to SQLite 3. And it's really neat because you can do like all kinds of commands and you can put data in, you can get data out. Um, Sometimes it's a, it's a great way to learn how to use a database. And it's also a great way if you have a more complex like set of data and you want to put it into a database, boom, like you can just put it in there and do all kinds of cool queries and things like that. And that's one of those things when I started using just a database, a lot of my programs took off because once you put a little bit of data in the database, you're like, well, let's put all the data in there and let's do all these complex queries. And you really start learning quickly because you just start seeing the potential. Um, and SQLite 3 stands up, you know, it's like it will, you know, it holds up to that potential. It's, it's, a, full, it's a full database. Um, you don't need Postgres yet. If you want to learn more, let me see. Um, there are, of course, the Python docs, um, which you can get to, but they are written for programmers that have been around for a while. Let's see, Doug Hellman, book. That's Doug over there. He has this in Python 2. 
So yes, this is the Python 2 one, I think. I'm checking. Because every time I see him, I ask him, is it in 3 yet? And he's like, we're totally working on that. So we'll see if he's actually put 3 out. If this is in 2, it actually doesn't matter too much because many of the modules, there's like cosmetic changes. But he also has Python module of the week, and he has it for Python 3. This is a great website. Um, it's pymotw.com slash three. And maybe it is in three now. Okay, well, you can look on the Amazon page just to tell you. But these are all the modules that he's covered. And one of the great things about the way he's covered them is that he's not just like, this is how it works, deal. He actually goes through and does an example of each one and has warnings for when you may not want to use it because it may not do what you think it does. Or maybe there's a better way to do it um, and can point you that way. So this is a really great website. I would highly recommend everyone checking it out. In fact, I'm going to put it in the comments. Do, 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 do. Do, do, do. Get in. there. So, and I love his book too, because sometimes it's nice to just have a physical thing that you can have open next to you or browse through um, with your thumb. So the next thing, uh, and as I said, there are the Python docs, which if you need a more in-depth or you're more comfortable with a more in-depth coverage, then you can go to docs.python.org. And ta-da, all the documentation. And recently, like, redesigned. They look really nice now. So we're at 11.53. Let's talk about what next, because a lot of people get through this class, and they're like, OK, what now? I have this random collection of knowledge about how to do Python. I kind of want a next step. And one of my recommendations is there's a lot of places you can go to next and kind of figure out like where would you most want to go. So if you're into web, to the, I'll cover a few like web development, game development, science stuff, databases, smartphone stuff, um, and some other things like maintenance and becoming a better developer kind of things you can do. First is web development. I recommend starting off with Flask. Flask is probably the easiest one, easiest framework to learn. It's easy to install. Let me pull it up. This is Flask, super easy. Um, if you can write a function, you can write Flask. And it will actually help you understand web development better. Because the next step is often Django, which is kind of like the hands down. That's where you go to when you want to have a framework to do web development. That's like the next one you would go to. And you don't have, it's not saying that, oh, you know, Django is better than Flask. It's usually, okay, my needs have outgrown what Flask can do comfortably. Um, and I kind of want to move over because I want to have a database. And I don't want to have to do all the stuff that Flask does with like SQL Alchemy. And you kind of know that you'll, you'll figure that out yourself um, when you come to a point where you're like, okay, I'm working too hard to do these very basic things. And that's the power of Flask is that it does not come with a bunch of stuff with it. So it's very flexible. That's the power of Django. It comes with a bunch of stuff that you don't want to have to write every time you create a web app. So Django and Flask. And here is Django's website. Ta-da, Django. And this is Django's website. And actually, you can create a, um, if you want to play with Django, um, Cloud9 has it where you can just set up a Django workspace really easily. Let's see. Um, so this is the two I recommend for web development. If you want to do game development, I recommend Pygame. Pygame is a really great library. Um, they have lots of like tutorials and examples and stuff um, and code you can download and check out. Um, it's fun. It has like, you know, it's not, you're not in the Unity engine, but you're definitely doing some cool stuff. So it's a great place if you want to do some light game development. Um, they also have a something called PyWeek. 
pyweek.org. All right, pyweek.org. Um, I think they do this like once or twice a year. Oh, they have to do it like, yeah, they do it twice a year. Twice a year, they have a contest. Um, you can join teams, you can submit your own thing, and you basically code a game in a week, which is a lot of fun. And stuff like that, it can feel really intimidating, but you'd be surprised like how much you can learn in one week. If you want to do science stuff, including lots of data analysis, you want to look at SciPy. SciPy is kind of like a collection of um, different modules and libraries all put together in a really convenient, hold on a sec, phone. Um, all put together in like one nice package. And it can do like lots of data structure and analysis. We, I'm reading off of here. Um, scientific computing, you know, lots of really complex math stuff. If you need a real random library, not the pseudo random library, this is where you go. Um, it's just a really great package. And I'll warn you, it's not always easy to set up. So, you know, getting some help there might be something you want to do. I don't know if they've improved that since we tried a few years ago. Uh, for databases. There's SQL Alchemy, which is a way that you can you can install that. It's an easy way to talk to databases. I generally just say, unless you really just want to directly talk to the database, um, you may just want to go with Django. Django will create a, da a database for you off of some models that you create. And it might just be an easier way unless you have some really complex needs. And for many people, your needs are not as complex as you think they are. Um, so you might just want to start with Django because that would be a place where you'd honestly get a lot more help on the internet. If you want to do smartphone stuff, Kibi, let's bring up Kibi. Kibi is a really interesting project. Um, project. Uh, if you want to program directly onto Android, you need to learn Java. Um, if you want to if you want to program for iOS, it's Swift now. Um, if you don't want to learn those two languages, which I don't blame you, since you know often we want to program for both, check out Kivi, because with Kivi you basically write in Python, you create one program, and then it exports to both OSs. And it's it's pretty. It's got a lot of neat things about that. It's definitely still being developed upon. So there's some tweaks that are you know some weak spots, but it's getting more and more solid. Um, so it's a really interesting project. Check it out. But I would recommend having Python skills that are a bit stronger because this does not hold your hand. <laughs> it's it's a more advanced um, project. But people always ask. Um, some things you may want to look into, because one of the things you're going to want to do is getting your environment set up correctly, which means learning how to use things like virtualenv and virtualenv wrapper, which we're going to have a class later on this year about getting everything set up correctly. But for right now, you may want to look into that. So that is virtualenv. What that does is it keeps everything you install in one nice tight little bundle, um, in one little bubble. So you can have like many different projects on your computer and they're not touching. They're all in their own protective bubble. Learning how to use PIP is interesting. Let me go back to here because with PIP, control D, you can actually install new modules. Um, so you can go out and you can install like say Django you would say pip install Django, and it would install Django for you. Pip install Flask, it would install Flask. So getting an idea, like, and uh, by the way, learning how to use pip is like literally like two commands you need to learn. Um, but finding out like what's out there and playing around with it and, you know, seeing what's available. Um, there's a lot of stuff out there because it all pulls from a place called PyPy. This is PyPy, the Python package index. And here are the things that you can install. And this is just what's been updated recently. Um, what's out there is a huge number of things that people have put on PyPy that you can install using pip. And Git is another thing I highly recommend learning. 
many, many, many Python developers use GitHub, which uses Git, which is a way to store your code. Basically, it's a way to version your code and also store it somewhere else rather than your local machine. Um, learn Git. We're also going to have a class on Git later this year. And finally, learn some Linux. I know people that use Macs and I know people that use Windows don't think they think they may not need to know how to use Linux. But once your code is off of your computer and it's out there in the world, I assure you, it's on a Linux box. And what is Linux? No, I don't want to be up there. It's an open source um, operating system. There's a bunch of different flavors. Um, there's Ubuntu, maybe one you've heard of. Uh, Mint is out there. I'm so behind on all the different flavors now. But basically, knowing how to use Linux is super important. If you're on a Mac, you're part of the way there. You're close. If you're on a Windows, we're going to have to teach you a lot because it's totally different. Um, but seriously, once it's off your computer, it's going to live on a Linux machine somewhere. So it's really important to do that. And yes, we're also going to have a class on that later this year. And in fact, let me pull up my keep and I will go over what the rest of the classes are for the year. Because um, I have a list of them. So this was our intro to Python class. Next month, we'll have an intro to Flask so we can get kind of used to web development. If you've taken this class, you're ready for that one. We have Intro to Django, which will be the month after that, which will be more advanced web development. Then we're going to get into an introduction into the Unix command line, which is getting to know Linux. If you see star Nix, that usually means like whatever kind of Unix Linux environment you're working in. Um, Django REST framework will be after that to get into APIs. We'll be introducing Git after that. So learning how to version your code and actually just save it correctly, save it sanely so you don't, you know, completely like blow yourself up. Um, we'll be doing a quick intro to HTML and CSS because some people, if you do web development, you know, you kind of need to know that. Introduction to JavaScript because trust me, it makes your life a whole lot easier if you do any kind of web development. Um, introduction to testing. Yes, you should test your code. Don't worry about the, what that is right now. We'll get into that then. Um, I'm doing a Pi game class towards the end of the year, and we'll be doing introdu introductions into databases. So that's what we have for the rest of the year. If you have any other requests, let me know, and I'll see if I can move things or condense things in the schedule. Um, but for now, we are ending early because I plowed through the data and didn't take a long break. So I hope this was useful to everybody, and I will see everybody next time.